Hi folks, it's Matt here from the Ask the Arb podcast. Before we get stuck into today's podcast, I'd just like to ask you a favour. If you've ever got any value from this podcast, you could do us a massive favour uh, by going to wherever you get your podcast from and subscribing to the show and leaving us a review. You can also follow us on Instagram at go-rover, and that would be fantastic. So let's jump right into today's. So folks, today I am excited because I've been trying to get this chap onto the podcast for quite a while. Uh, The chap is Graham Collard. Graham Collard is the Director of Health and Safety Services at uh, CDMM UK Limited. They are based up here near our head office at uh, Inverness up in the Highlands. I think you've got an office down south somewhere as well, haven't you, Graham? Yeah, we've got an office uh, in Stirling as well so that we service but the central belt from. Is that is that down south? I mean, it's all relative, isn't it? Well, I suppose so. Mm. Yeah, yeah, something like that, something like that. So uh, Graham and I have known each other for a number of years, and I'm sure We'll, we'll come to that uh, as time goes on. But your career, Graham, first off, uh, it's very topical having you in today because um, I'm not sure. I'll look at the camera because we are videoing this and uh, I'll point I'll them point ahead. However, it's not turned Sorry, as fast. It's, 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 it's professionalism. It's, it's not just, very good, is it? It's not on, although I didn't press record at the start of this. Well, that's true. Um, how do I stop that from happening again? I'll put on um, silent. That's better than where we well, are. Just now, we'll just it? wave, away from myself. wave, wave at someone in the office to come and come and get it. So, yeah, it's topical that you've come in today because, uh, as, as I said there, Graham's the Director of Health and Safety Services, which sounds really boring, so we're going to try and sex it up a little bit. <laughs> um, however, uh, yeah, because I walk smack into the garage door at yeah. home at the weekend. And I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah. Your head. It, it does... Uh, Man cave stuff, you see. Trying to do DIY at the weekend when the reality is I probably should have got someone to do it. Mm. And yeah, it was pouring the rain, garage door half open, walked into it, knocked myself out. But like a real trooper, I carried on and, and, and did the electrical work at home and the house hasn't burnt down yet, so... No, con- no concussion as far as I can tell so. Wonderful, I mean at a personal level well done and on a professional level uh, there are a number of holes to pick in that from, from a legal point of view I'm sure, good, because yeah. we, can, we, can, <laughs> we can come on to that um, So yeah, I mean most of our listeners tend to have found us through marketing material that we have put out there is some organic growth with the podcast and obviously I share it amongst my uh, professional network but generally speaking the listeners, the people listening to this are um, homeowners, mm-hmm. architects, planning consultants that are involved in in small residential development. Just to just to give it a little bit of context. So, with that being in mind, I'm going to take you way, way, way back. <laughs> oh, no, you're not that old. Way back to your university days when you were studying mechanical engineering, mm. which. I've known you for a number of years, mm. and at no point have you displayed any talents whatsoever <laughs> in that particular That's area. Unfair. So, <laughs> what about the trooper that I lovingly well, kept on yeah, the road, and the quite, MB track, and the chipper? And yes. Yeah, I, duct I tape. You never, never asked me to fix any of your stuff, actually. So that's probably that's telling. true. Yeah. That's true. Mm. So what, what led you into? Well, first off, what sort of, what led you to, uh, to choose that particular course? Where did you go, and what age were you when you started on that journey? Yeah, I, I, was, I was 17 and I think I was driven as much as anything else by the desire to move out and uh, uh, yeah, it, it was it was a, a bit of a backwards uh, career selection. Um, I think it was chosen really on the basis that I did like fixing stuff and taking it apart and I was reasonably good at physics and I think that's probably the about as much thought that went into it to be honest. Really? Mm. So I studied in uh, at Napier University in Edinburgh um, enjoyed my time there. Enjoyed Edinburgh. Still like Edinburgh. I think if I had to live in a city, that's where I'd like to live. Yeah, I love Edinburgh. I was mm. there yesterday. Oh yeah. Mm. Mm. Still get down. Still have some friends there. Yeah. No, it's a good. It's it it it's a beautiful city. Mm. I could I could spend a lot of time there. In fact, if I could if I was going to live in a city, Edinburgh would probably be one of the ones that would be mm. right top of the list. Yeah, me too. So, have you looked at what a flat costs in Edinburgh? No. Yeah, don't. Although my son James was uh, pointing at buildings and, and going, wow, yesterday, because uh, he doesn't very often 
come out of the Highlands, let alone go to a big city. So yeah, it was a bit like a Neanderthal man who's just been <laughs> parachuted in there, pointing pointing at people and buildings and, Look, and all Dad, sorts. They, they make buildings that are more than four stories tall. That's right. I know yeah. it's about one and a half stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's amazing, isn't it? So how long was that university course? Four years. Four years. And was there a practical placement element to that? Was there? <laughs> there was, but I didn't get one. Oh right. So I, I my I um sort of fell out with uni a bit or fell out of love with it maybe I wasn't ever in love with it I think probably part of what I learned at uni is that I wasn't as academic as maybe mm. I thought I was or or maybe I wanted to be um, so I actually finished that course after third year so the course was four years um, but my attendance at that course didn't quite last four years so I've got a non honours I've got an ordinary bachelor's degree um, and during that time I ended up working for part time for a tree surgery company in Edinburgh. So this is where the tree oh, thing yes, started. I was, I was going to get to mm. that. Yeah, and I, I, I was graduating around the time of the financial crash, and Edinburgh being uh, the headquarters then of the, the Royal Bank. Mm. There were lots of people tied up one way or the other with finance in, in Edinburgh, and very very quickly, um, it felt very difficult to get a graduate job uh, around that time. And I kind of felt like I knew as much, if not maybe more, about trees and stuff than I did about engineering. And I probably learned as much about engineering breaking stuff than I had in uni. Or maybe those two were sympathetic to each other, I don't know. So there was overlap there? There was overlap, yeah. yeah. I, was working, I was working when I was a student. Right. Um, which meant I was also roaring about Edinburgh City Centre in a hanging ex Forestry Commission pickup truck as a student. And I, yeah, well, as you can, perfect, knowing me it? as you do, I was delighted with, yeah. with myself. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Did you get? Did, did you do any tree swinging back in those days? A little. Yeah. yeah. I think the 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 guys that were climbing were always the guys that we we wanted to be. Um, but we sort of me, my flatmate and I sort of had a ticket between us you know and uh, yeah so yeah it, <laughs> we, the, the 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 climbing arborist is always the hero on the on on the tree team but they they the, the, usually the one that um sits at the top of the tree drinking coffee where everyone else is dragging yeah and goes have you not, have you not cleared that up yeah yeah yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah that's it i've i've never done that i've no. always been really nice to my to my groundies back in back in the days so you're working working in Edinburgh, working for a uh, tree surgery company. So at some point, you moved up to the Highlands. I did. And like all good stories, this one's about a girl. Ah, uh, yeah. So well, you've met my wife. I mean, oh, well, that is that one. I'm. I'm mm. Well, that's handy. Mm. That's good because otherwise it could have been really could embarrassing. Be yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, she she's not going to watch this. Um, yeah, she, um, she informed me that we're moving to the Highlands. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? Uh, and that's where our paths first crossed. So we started well, working in uh, in Speyside, and don't think you were quite there when I first joined. Where you you came? In, you came no, in I w- I think around that time I was probably working. Um, I was working for a Nabora cultural consultant in North Wales called Scott. Fairly, gosh, I can't remember his name though. I think he's in Canada now. Mm. Um, he sent me an email the other day, uh, and yeah, I think I was working as a junior or sub consultant for him before I'd started up on my own. Um, and yeah, I was aware of the company that you were working for. Well, we can mention it, Highland Forestry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, didn't didn't end well, but uh, yeah. No. Highland Forestry is no longer, but um, we we were in contact. I think we were both in contact with the boss at the time. Uh, and he got me up here to do some tree safety surveys, I think. So that would have been about the about the time our our, cross, our paths crossed, rather. Mm. So what sort of what sort of task did you perform when you moved to the Highlands for Highland Forestry? I was, a, I was a chainsaw operator. Um, yeah. So yeah, cutting and stuffing a chipper mostly, and then gradually fixing stuff. Not your stuff. No. Yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, I do remember you uh, vividly trying to repair a green mech tracked oh, chipper at a distillery somewhere I that was, I remember that. It was vastly being it well it was being asked to do something it was never designed for as i recall where we, where we there was a degree of winching wasn't there mm. um dal you in the distillery which i've since been back to to manage a shutdown so oh there you go a wonderful Full circularity circle. to these things yeah mm. um 
Yes, I was rather intimately familiar with the inner workings of uh, the Greenmec ST1928 by the end of that particular mm. uh, particularly the, of my life. Particularly the electrics, as I The as electrics I and the hydraulics, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not wasted then, that that, that degree wasn't wasted. I, re- I really enjoyed that, mm. although it was frustrating when it stopped working, obviously. But I did, I did enjoy the fixing. I still enjoy fixing stuff. I, I don't know, I think you're an engineer by nature as much as by training and... I like doing it. I like messing about with it. Well, it's a very Highland thing as well, isn't it? And I guess people that haven't lived up here don't necessarily understand that, that when something breaks, there isn't somebody there that can get you within 20 minutes to fix it. There has to be a degree of... Having a shot at it. Yeah. (laughs) Resilience and reliance, whatever that may be. Mm. Yeah, duct tape and and Velcro and all that kind of good stuff. So I think, um, if I remember rightly, you eventually progressed through Highland Forestry mm. to um, an operations manager role. Was that a, what? What? What kind of task did that involve? Because that wasn't so much chainsaw swinging, I guess. No, it was a bit. Um, we when I mean, the business started, started growing, started taking off some more um, meaty contracts, started trying to go direct to client and not always be working through mm. you know an intermediary like an, a, an estate factor or. A, a management organisation, which was the right direction for it. Um, and so one of the places that we ended up working was with the railway. And my uh, skill set in terms of being able to write stuff down that sounded sensible and, and yeah. interface with those sorts of things kind of led into running that bit of it. And so it was quite a lot of... Um, I guess that's pro- probably where the start of my health and safety stuff came from, although I wouldn't have called it that at the time. Oh, it's like you've seen where I'm going with this. Mm, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Because I, I would imagine <laughs> that the uh, the railways in particular must be a hellish environment for health and safety and ticking the right boxes. And yeah, I, I, you see, you say hellish I, again. I quite enjoyed it. I viewed it as a challenge. And, mm. You know, as the kind of as the newcomer there, where you are being slightly, you know, you've you've, be, you've been made to feel like by a by a management organisation that this is far too complicated for you and you can't possibly go direct to network rail. You'll always have to work through us. Um, that was as a bit of a red flag to bull to mm. to me, to be honest. And you think, well, how hard is it? How hard can it be? And so I quite actually quite enjoyed. That was just another engineering problem to be solved in my mind. In terms of right, okay, so what are they looking for? What do we need to do? What training do we need to have so that we can do this? And we're not handing over effectively all of the profit and all of the value adding components of this job to someone else to do the paperwork. Yeah. Um, where we are put old as are left with all the kit to maintain all of the competencies to keep current mm. all of the people all of the expensive diesel burning stuff and none of the ability to make any money from it so yeah that's that's and i mean how that does went. that how does that work is there a direct facing um contact or somebody that you interact with on site or is this all done kind of remotely through email and telephone and it depends there, there, i mean this may have changed since the, my railway experience is out of date now but in those days, there was two ways they could do it. Either network rail would take you on a day rate, in which case you'd be given a babysitter, and you'd mm. probably go out in a network rail vehicle, and you were just there to to do whatever that individual needed done. Um, and sometimes, if it was a, a more meaty contract, they would want you to supervise it and, and plan it yourself. And that was where the kind of extra components came in. So there was a a competence called um, Safe System of Work Planner, which I don't know if that still exists or not, but. The that would involve you interfacing with the signalers effectively in that whole department to say this is what we want to do, this is where we want to do it and you'd have to identify your protecting signals and mm. how you were going to keep yourself safe from trains and keep trains safe from what you were going to do and if that was all accepted, so that was a desktop exercise really, lots of maps of uh, railways which I've probably still got in the house somewhere <laughs> um, Don't admit to that Yeah, useless information isn't it um, and then when on you know on on the actual shift when you actually came to do the job there'd be a degree of interface with the, mm. the signaller who was controlling that section of track to say right this is who I am I'm the cos well again I think that terminology's changed now the controller of site safety that stood for and uh, you would have to go and tell the signaller this is who I am it's booked here's the reference number and tell them what you were doing where you were doing what your protecting signals were, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a whole procedure to go through to actually get authorised to go and do what you needed to do. And for tree stuff, this the majority of this was done at night because uh, the, the, the question that was asked was always, could your works affect the safety of the line? And the answer to that, if you're felling a tree, was always, yes, they could. Yeah. Um, whether by planning or by uh, a 
an unforeseen circumstance they could mm-hmm. affect the safety of the line and so typically they would want you to do that at night so that the, you could take you know four or five hours that we typically have yeah. between last service and first service to, to do what you needed to do because I think that was probably roughly the point where our piles started to part and go in yeah. different directions because I, I don't think I had an awful lot to do with the railway mainly because I wasn't qualified to to, um, no, to be you, you to be involved have, with you it you could have been qualif- you could have got um, qualified to it I think but yeah, I, I managed to sidestep that particular bullet, I think. You did, so. that was the point where we all started um, uh, questioning your sanity even more than we had up to this point. So yeah. uh, up to this point, uh, we would question Matt's sanity um, by his absolute dogged loyalty to increasingly unreliable Land Rover products of all shapes, mm. something which you've not managed to shake. No, no. And after that point, we questioned your sanity because you had ditched what looked to be a reasonably successful career to go and play with model helicopters. As, yes, as far as yeah. as far as we could work out, yeah. there was some yeah. sort of slightly vague story about how the, everybody was going to want to rent this model helicopter because you could take pictures of trees from the top or something. I know, we, I know. We never it's really like, understood what you were talking it's, about. It's, it's, and, it's, yeah, and mm. uh, well, neither did clients. Actually, that's another story. <laughs> we'll we'll have to flip it and get someone to interview me at one point. But yeah, yeah, no, no, no nobody, nobody got on that train with me um, no. uh, back then. And you're right, that was that was sort of the tail end of. 2014, something like that, that, that I went was. off and started mm. Rover. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, changed the path of the existing business and, mm. and um, yeah, started to play with model helicopters. <laughs> That's been good fun. Can't really, <laughs> mate. So around kind of tail end of 2014, mm. um, you bid good well to uh, Highland Forestry I and did. you went to work for Shoreclean. Mm. What did that role entail and, and how did that... How well, did that I, move come I, about? I don't want your listeners to get the wrong idea, but that's another company that no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, that came about because I was finding forestry increasingly incompatible with family life. I mm-hmm. knew all about that, yes. and particularly the bit of forestry that I'd been involved with, which was quite often national, quite often night shift. Um, yeah, so I, I really wanted a job where I could be in my own bed every night and... Um, my son was would have been on the way, I would think, at that mm. point. And, uh, yeah, so I managed to talk myself into my first health and safety only job, which was with SureClean, who were a... They're basically an industrial cleaning company. Right. But they it was it turned out to be a fantastic, uh, a fantastic introduction to safety. I worked for uh, a wonderful lady called Laura Beals, who is still in the Highlands and still practising, and... Um, but basically, if it was dangerous, they dealt with it. Confined space, explosive mm. stuff, offshore, oil and gas, asbestos, um, norm, which is um, low low activity radioactive material. You know, work at height, tanks, high pressure water jetting was kind of their thing. But there was all the stuff that went with that. They had all their own. They had an engineering department to look after their own kit. They had the ability to fabricate and spray stuff, and so it was just a really, really great in- introduction into industrial safety and some of the, the contracting experience that I had was mm. helpful because it's the same sort of people um, and there's still you're ultimately working for a contractor that is the requirement to make money um, yes. we're not there to be um, the world's most boring health and safety experts, we were there to get something done, albeit it needed to be done safely and it needed to be controlled properly but it was it was a great job, I really really yeah. enjoyed it and um, yeah, we, 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 did, we did a couple of um, drone jobs for them actually as, as I as I recall, yeah. Did you not do some promo stuff? I think we did some yeah. promo stuff, and I think we did some other bits and bobs for them right mm. right, right back in the day. And in fact, my um, brother-in-law worked for them for a little while as well. So, yeah, inter- right. interesting, fact, interesting, you, you did, yeah, right. interesting bit of... And he went on to kill a policeman on... Shetland, Shetland. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. It's amazing, the direction that, that people's career is going. So, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing if you were... Do we need to um, underline that that's a joke? Or we just leave it hanging? I, I would just leave it hanging. Right. It's fine, people can... Google. Mm. Um, so I'm guessing while you were working for Shawclean, there must have been at some point a realization that if this is something you enjoy and you and you want to see some kind of progression, mm. because humans need progression to feel mm. that they're developing. Yep. You've got a young family now mm-hmm. um, to look after. So there must have been some point where you're like, "Hang on a second, I need to do some kind of formal." Health and safety training. Did that happen oh, I'd, I'd during? Done, I'd actually done that already. So oh, right, okay. T- towards the, the end of my time in forestry, um, we were working on the uh, locally infamous, at least, Beulah Denny <laughs> transmission line upgrade, which is a new transmission line 
uh, right across the Highlands, and that was another interaction with uh, Tier 1 contractors, SSE, Balfour BT, mm. um, and meeting people for the first time probably who were safety professionals and thinking, I could do this. Um, I, I remember, I actually, I can remember, I'm going to tell, I'll tell the story, you can edit it out if it's too boring. <laughs> There was under the previous iteration of uh, of construction design management regulations, there was a position called site safety coordinator, and we were under some pressure as the as the as the tree folk uh, if we were first on site as we frequently were mm. to sign in as site safety coordinator. And there was a little bit of a, a row about this because uh, my argument was that if there are other if there's other stuff going on on this site, which could be anything, survey work could be fairly significant civil engineering. Uh, and anything in between I'm not coordinating the safety on that I don't know what they're doing I don't even if yeah. they've come in behind me I won't even know they're there these are large very large rural remote sites um, and so there was a there was, there was an argument about this and basically I was told to shut up and get on with it by the people that were working for it at that stage and that, that was what had to happen and so I had to get on and do it and I thought that's fine if you want site safety coordination I shall coordinate the safety on your site and so I spent the day <laughs> ejecting people from the site for not following the rules that we'd been given. So I chucked a guy off the site because he was rallying around on a forestry track in uh, a fairly elderly Volkswagen Polo with a mountain bike on the back of it. I chucked somebody else off who turned out to be quite senior, I think he was a senior partner in the surveyors who were looking after the whole job because <laughs> he was wandering about in a pair of rather nice brown uh, brogues with, very a, good. with a very friendly Labrador. Mm. Um, he was he was actually very understanding. <laughs> he says, no, no, you're quite right, you're quite right. Um, and I also ejected uh, somebody who worked for a local surveyor who I won't mention, who a South African gentleman, uh, who um, offered to fill me in. So that was nice of him. Uh, right. I declined. Anyway, eventually um, a, a Balfour Beatty pickup appeared, and uh, a gentleman got out and asked for me by name. Yeah, it says, "Who are you?" And he turned out to be the head of health and safety for the, the Balfour delivery team on this project mm. and he sort of said with a broad grin you know what's going on then and so I explained the whole situation um, we end up having a long chat and uh, he sort of planted the seed then look you've obviously got a degree of aptitude for this yeah, I think you've made your point you know we'll go back yeah. and we'll have the discussion about wh- who the appropriate person to be this I'll is. take over now son exactly get back to work <laughs> yeah, there was a bit of that um, but it occurred to me honestly as he drove away it occurred to me as a self-employed subcontractor, as I was at that point, I hope no one from the HMRC is listening, um, that I was sitting there in a vehicle that I had to buy and maintain, and I was doing thirty-five or 40,000 miles a year in it, I had to fuel it, I was you know, mm-hmm. regularly spending a couple hundred quid a week in diesel, just for me, I was probably wearing a thousand pounds between PPE and um, you know, whatever else, chainsaws, all this yeah. stuff, it was an expensive way to make a living. And um, yeah, if yeah, if you got paid. Um, <laughs> and he'd turned up in a pickup that somebody else paid for. All he needed to do his job was a laptop that somebody else paid for. And he probably earned more than me. And I thought, I'm probably facing the wrong direction here. And if mm. this is something that I can do, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And so let's have a shot at that. And so at that point, and that's probably three or four years before I finally parted company with yeah. forestry, I went and I did an e-bosh. Right, and okay. I did that, paid for that myself, and went and did that uh, at Inverness College. Actually, it was a good course. Um, but that was so. I so that went that it was that formal qualification that enabled me to get the job at Shirley. Right, I just walked in and said, "No, I want to do health and yeah, safety." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hold a pen the right way. Sometimes, yeah, that's that's usually usually quite helpful. So eventually, towards the um, middle of 2016. You part ways with um, Shore Clean. This is good LinkedIn digging you've done, by the way. I didn't get any of these dates. I know. I'm well, impressed. you need to stop putting. Well, I'm assuming this is correct. Of course, this could just be yeah. pure lies. Because yeah. I heard a statistic the other day: something like ninety percent of people lie on their CVs, and high eighty percent of people lie in interviews. Which I, I, this confuses me, because these are just easily discoverable lies, aren't they? I mean, it's not difficult to. Nobody checks. Ah, but it comes out in the wash. You find, you know, you can smell it. People, will... I, I think my personal opinion is it, it, it does, yes. But by by then, how far down the employment track has that person got, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm part of a business mentoring group um, mm. that meets once a month down in Birmingham, so I hear all sorts of stories, some of which I obviously can't <laughs> talk about on here. Uh, and uh, we had a guy in the other day who is a um, he's an HR. 
he runs an HR company. Mm. Uh, and that sounds really boring. But actually, it was a very, very interesting chat. And that's where all these figures and, and, and information came out of. And he said it's because of the way humans work and they want to try and avoid confrontation all the time, that um, quite often, particularly in larger companies, when bodies are employed, there is no checking done. It's just they don't follow up on references. They don't follow up on qualifications, mm. which does seem mad to me. It does. But there we go. It is what it is. I really I, I don't like any of that. It annoys me. No. And I, I don't have any... Do you get any tattoos? You don't get any tattoos, have you? No. No, I don't either. Um... But the only the, I, had, I came across a phrase in a book once, and I thought this is n- in nearly. If I had to get a tattoo, if you put a gun to my head and said mm. you have to get a tattoo, what do you want? Um, and the phrase it's a Latin phrase, and it's uh, I, I'm probably murdering this Latin pronunciation. <laughs> a huge amount of Latin oh, at my oh. primary school in Glasgow. Did you? <laughs> um, uh, essay quam videri, and it means to be rather than to appear. And I'd I just I'd much rather be a good one of what I am and not be trying kidding on that I'm something different no. to what I am well then people be, find it out totally but I just I think these people must just go through their lives with so much stress try to kid on that they're something they're not all I just it doesn't, yeah. I don't understand why you'd want to do it well it's it's, it's probably one for a, for another podcast <laughs> but there's the it, yeah I mean there's lots of deep psychological reasons for that aren't there and the, mm. the six basic human needs and whichever one of those is, is your primary need will define the course of your life essentially and it's I like guess Maslow's hierarchy of needs you're about to start talking about it, no it? it's more Tony Robbins actually but there we go um, but yeah I mean he should have brought my baseball cap yeah. <laughs> uh, and sunglasses and some fake tan yeah. but um, yeah and Wall I guess those computer screens in here as well those kinds of people you're probably you know their primary drivers are a significance essentially and they'll they'll violate all mm. kinds of beliefs in order to feel significant. But there we go, we, we, we digress. Mm. So, yes, middle of 2016, you move to <laughs> Citation. Who are Citation? Because this seems like a fairly serious step towards your current position it now. Was, it was a very significant step towards my current position, although I hated it. Really? Yeah. It's been a good... It, it's, it's proved to have been a good career move, but I didn't enjoy it. Mm. So Citation are a national operator... Uh, they do health and safety consultancy um, on a national basis and not to put too fine a point on it I nearly doubled my salary in one move from where it was yeah. so it, it was it was a no brainer oh, the other thing that I did in this intervening time by the way which was also stupid you were talking about need for progression was I moved my entire family into a caravan so we could build a house oh yes so, I remember that <laughs> there was a degree of stress around that there was other stuff going on but anyway, I took this job and I just didn't enjoy it. I just didn't enjoy it. I I, I think that the, the you don't get very much achieved without building a relationship. Mm. And if you are doing consultancy in that way where you see people for one day a year, in fact, it wouldn't even be a half day a year, would be the typical contact that I had with the clients in that role, you can't build any kind of relationship. Yeah. So you're not actually going to affect any kind of change. So, I, I mean, I, I felt like a sales rep, really. You know, very nice company car allowance, you know, now living it. Mm. And, I did, yeah, it's, it's, it just wasn't what I wanted to do. It made me really unhappy. And it took me quite a long time to work out that it was making me unhappy or why. Because it's, it appeared it appeared to be what success looked like. You know, it was, mm. it was relatively well paid. Um, it was a... They're a, they're a large organisation. They 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 won some accolades for being um, best employers at Sunday Times best probably employers yeah. list or something. They were on this, and they you know they had a great HR department. Everything was neat and tidy and looked how it should look. But I, it's not how I wanted to do. Well, mo- what for, I do. for for most people, success is is um, it's linked to making a difference and improving the not necessarily quality of life, but the situation whatever your target is and and we do that i bang that drum a lot within this business is that um i don't care if we don't get a commission out of something i just want to make sure that we do as best job as we possibly can do and and help people and if you're that kind of person then yeah the the financial compensation you could probably double your salary again you would have still been unhappy yeah yeah i mean i think that I, i i think that's absolutely true i mean how much money do you actually need Quite. Um, I think as long as everybody's clothed and fed, and there's a bit put aside, 
and I'm a quite a simple creature really I don't need yeah. much and I'm lucky to be married to a woman who's very much of, of similar uh, ilk there's a lot of very wealthy unhappy people out there yeah well so. I'm, I'm not I'm not, not keen to be one of them no so, yeah absolutely so I, I don't know how long I was there you'll be with me I, can, I can tell you you were there about oh let me look at this about, about six months is that, it was only six months yeah well look, uh, yeah. according to <clears throat> LinkedIn <laughs> I, think, I think my LinkedIn's accurate yeah May 2016 to December 2016 do you know actually that, that's probably right because I actually I took the decision to resign uh, after my probationary mm. uh, meeting with my manager well we we use a similar health and safety consultancy mm. which I probably won't mention on here mm. and what you've just parroted back to me then is exactly my experience with them we see them once a year um, it's very salesy based there's no real relationship they've got lots of online tools but I don't feel like I can uh, reach out to them and get any really quality useful advice so so yeah. there's, a, there's a couple of things there. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and slag them off. I understand why they're doing. They had a very powerful commercial model, and it worked for them. Mm. And that's fine. I had some frustrations with the guy who was managing me. I don't think, even if he does watch this, which I think is fairly unlikely, I don't think that would be news to him. Um, there were various things. There were various practical considerations, which, looking back on it, maybe were uh, as much about the fact that I fundamentally wasn't happy where I was as they were about the practical considerations. But there was lots of things about. Um, the size of patch and effectively, you know, on a business of that scale, you're managing your, your people on KPIs. Um, and effectively, in terms of the amount of people I saw in a given month uh, and the amount of money that I cost in a given month, I was being um, compared with somebody who covered, let's say, half of Manchester yes. and did it on the train. And I was covering every, absolutely everything north of Perth. Yeah. Um, actually, that's not quite true. There was somebody in Aberdeen, but it, but right up to Fraserburgh at Peterhead. And for those of you who don't know, it's not that far on the map, um, but it's three hours drive from here. Yeah. So I, I, I had had conversations until I was blue in the face with various people involved with my line management there about like this. You, you can, I can't nip to <laughs> these no. places. Um, you know, if I'm on Sky and you get me a cancellation and it's you know somewhere else, mm. then I'm not going to be able to be there, and that's just the way it is. And the guy, I'll never forget this line, and it, it, it's the moment where I realised there's no point in having any more conversations, you're just going to have to go. <laughs> um, and I just kind of outlined that situation and said, look, this is, this is the equivalent of asking somebody who works out of your head office to cover appointments in South Glasgow, that they were head office in the Manchester yeah. area, um, and drive back again, home again every day, and then turn around and do it again the next day, and then be surprised that A, they're putting some fuel receipts in <laughs> uh, and B, they're probably not seeing as many clients as somebody who, you know, does it on the train. Um, and he said to me, I well, mate, it's a numbers game. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine for me. It's to find somebody else to do your numbers then. But the, the, the north of Scotland is scattered with stories like that, with businesses yeah. that have tried to push north of the, the border and then and they've realised that distance is a huge huge yeah. factor i mean we see it in the filming and the survey and inspection side of the business you know the, the can you just nip to jura isla and somewhere yeah. else in a day and you have to explain that with ferries and weather etc right. it's, it's just it's get just before you do anything. it's just not a thing yeah. it's not it's, it's not it's not going to happen so i agree so citation starts to drift away so they start to drift away i made the decision to so I, what i actually did in that period and this is where there might be some slight <laughs> LinkedIn anom anomalies here. I had a period where it didn't work, and I and I built the house. So yeah, I, I phoned Sophie on the way back from that appointment, and I said, "I'm so tempted to tell this guy to stick it," and she said, "Tell him to stick it." Yeah, and I thought, "Yes, <laughs> she's a keeper," she's which a is keeper. good because you're married to her. So. Mm. By that stage, I was very yeah. very married to her. Yeah, um, yeah. So I resigned. Hilariously, they didn't respond to the email uh, <laughs> saying that I'd resigned for I think ten days. Wow. And then the, the this wasn't the, um, the manager, this was some, another manager further up, said, uh, it's not my intention to accept this at the moment, we're going to give you some time to think about it. And I said, well, in terms of my reasons for resignation, the fact that you've uh, taken 10 days to respond to this is sort of the point, you know. Anyway, yeah. leaving that aside, we're not better about citation. No. Or whatever they might be called. Um, <laughs> so I built the house. So I, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I jacked and we had the, the money there the, to drawn down the mortgage to build a house mm. so I effectively we ate some of that for 
a year ish until the house was just about finished, but the money um, had just about run out. So th- this will be of interest to uh, the listeners. So you mm. you bought a plot with outline planning permission or planning in principle in, in Scotland? Uh, it actually a detailed planning permission. Oh right, okay. Uh, on it, yeah, it was a plot that was part of a development which had never been developed. Mm. So that was it made it easier. It was the first time we'd done it, so it made it easier for us. Um, but it did also restrict what we were able to do design wise, um, which we were initially very sad about because you know we watched. Um, too much grand designs. And yes, we, you know everything was going to be larch clad and have mm-hmm. you know, cathedral windows and whatever else. And the planning, uh, <laughs> not on that the it, top it, of a hill. It wasn't mm-hmm. going to have cathedral yeah. windows. She, I remember the lady that did the planning. We did pre pre application advice uh, through the Highland Council, and uh, she said mm-hmm. cathedral windows have kind of been done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, that's ouch. nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. dear. So, uh. so we bought it. Um, there was no trees, Matt. No, oh, need, well, no need for you. No ecology. No issues, ecology. No. Um, no planning conditions to discharge. There weren't any planning conditions to discharge. Wow. With, with respect to that, there were a few uh, um, conditions on the on the deed. What do you call them? Can't remember. No, I mean, there's some stuff in the deeds about you weren't allowed to have chickens and you're oh, you yes, yes, yes. two children yeah. and they had to be called yeah. Frederick and Matilda. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't park a sign written van outside, I, I otherwise have, you'll get yeah. shot. No vans or trailers above That's the central right. line of the house and yeah. all the rest of it. Uh, and I think hilariously somebody has reserved the right to stand guns on the perimeter. So I don't know what that means, but it sounds hilarious. It's, it's helpful. Mm, yeah. yeah, sounds great. Mm. Well, you're in an elevated position, so I guess arming your perimeter would be... Useful, a sensible yeah. thing to do. Essential, yeah. Repel essential. The invaders. Mm. Oh dear! So eventually, once once the house is kind of nearly, yeah, the nearly, house, the house nearly was done, livable, but not finished. Um, but I ran out of money, so I went back to work. And I I live in the village of one of the directors of CDMM, and he said uh-huh. it was a village fet, gala right. day, and um, I was wondering about the village, and I bumped into him, and he says, oh, "Hi, how are you getting on? Are you?" Uh, are you are you needing to go back to work, or are you finished the house, or yeah. you found a job, or something like this? And I said no, but I'm needing one. And he says, "Oh, well, I'll speak to this man." So he gave me a, a phone number for the then director of health and safety services, and I went and worked for them. And that was a very easy conversation. I, um, I met and uh, got on well with the director, and we worked together for quite a few years together. Fantastic. And, and what does your current role involve now? Then, what sort of things do you get involved with? Well, I have some people to look after for the first time since I'm in forestry. Yeah. So um, I have a health and safety consultant, and I need another one. I have a, a clerk of works, mm. and I have somebody who specialises in construction design management regulations, which govern construction. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a mixture. We have a mixture of clients who are contractors and who are building stuff we have some people who are not contractors and have other businesses and other sectors and we have architects designers and some clients who retain us to advise on the construction design management regs because there are some statutory documents that have to be prepared and various yeah. things to keep yourself right in that um, and the travel is a bit more limited now Travel is more limited, yeah. Certainly no requirement to be in both uh, Peterhead and Sky the same day. That's um, good. Yes, it is. Um, it's, it's a nice company. They're mm. all local folk. The There is an absolute absence of any corporate kind of BS. It's very straightforward. Um, yeah, I like it. It's a good place to be. Um, it's good. And it, in terms of... Uh, in terms of what we're actually doing, it's the opposite of um, some of some of the national operators in terms of very much trying to embed ourselves in these businesses. And mm-hmm. B, I don't want them to phone a help line. I want them to phone me or Chris or yeah. whoever they whoever they get on best with. I'm quite happy for them to phone that person. Um, and if that's just a simple case of advice down the phone, that's fine. If it's something that needs done and we book it in, that's fine too. I, you know, I want I want it to be like that. I, I want somebody to be able to come to us and they, and they can and they do and hire a fraction of a health and safety manager yeah. proportional to the size of business that you are and for you to have that named person um, or named people um, but to have that level of relationship where mm. we almost function like we're in your organisation. Um, Which is an extremely valuable thing to have any size of business really is to be able to have that support that you can pull on 
at short notice mm. when the shit's hitting the fan, essentially. Mm. So, one thing I did like to uh, did want to ask you as we kind of start to, uh, to 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 wrap this one up is a lot of our listeners are obviously um, homeowners. They might be embarking on a project where there is a you know, I don't know residential extension, two story rear extension, something like that. Um, they're project managing the whole thing themselves. They're going out to market. They're getting a uh, a builder in who is probably going to manage a number of a number of trades. Is there? Because I don't know the answer to this. Is there any liability sitting there for the homeowner? What sort of responsibility do they have towards these people that are coming onto their site? They have to tread carefully. Right, would be my advice. There are three statutory appointments that you have to make if you're doing a construction project and this is where the construction design management regulations come in Mm. there has to be a client there has to be a designer and there has to be a contractor if there are multiples of designers and contractors you have to have a structure for managing them called principal designer principal contractor but but broadly you have to have those three people Um, if at all possible the house owner wants to stay as client and they want to employ if they can uh, a good competent principal designer who, who's likely to be your architect and they want to employ a good competent principal contractor um, who can manage the sub trades underneath them and then that is really clean and yep. the, the almost <clears throat> all of the responsibility and the liability for what happens at a site level lives with the principal contractor nine times out of ten if there is enforcement on a building site it goes straight to the principal contractor because it's 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 their they site know. to manage, and they yeah. should know. And um, particularly if it's a domestic client, there's actually a, a provision in the regulations for for domestic clients, which reduce even further the amount of um, liability that they have and the amount of duties that they have under the regulations. Mm. Where it gets a little bit difficult is where you have the situation that you're alluding to there, and it's probably it's broadly what I did in my house, where really you've stepped over that client principal contractor line and really you're being the principal contractor because you're organising the trades, you're maybe doing some yep. of it yourself, you're hiring people and that's more difficult because then the in the absence of there being somebody else who has accepted a written appointment as principal contractor and is in control of the whole site, it's you. Yeah, because I, I mean I have a particular project in in my mind at the moment is a guy who has bought a um, house down south. Uh, He bought it 10 years ago. It's on a clay soil. Mm. Um, He didn't realise at the time that the property was suffering from subsidence. The Mm -hmm. property was built on uh, piles and the house itself is subsidence proof or the foundations have been designed to be tolerant to a shrinkable shrinkable soil. However, his garage and his uh, conservatory (laughs) weren't and they peeled off the property. It's got to the point where his family is expanding and he needs to um, uh, he needs more space so they looked at selling yeah. the property couldn't sell it basically yeah. because of these because of these it's issues difficult to mortgage probably, yeah would it? there's or, a big yeah. uh, off-site protected oak tree that's root protection area extends into the back garden of this property um, so it's been an utter nightmare to get this yeah. chap um, planning consent yeah we've now assisted him he's got planning consent for uh, it's basically a wraparound extension yeah it's obviously got to have piled foundations to yeah. be tolerable to the shrinkable soil but it's also got to um be respectful of the tree's root protection area so he's in a situation where a bridged foundation over the yes it's just it's it it, it's a terrible nightmare so um he's got an architect who's a really nice guy but he's well out of his uh, comfort zone now um he's got a main builder who's going to be uh building above the foundations he's got somebody that's building the foundations he's got a piling contractor Mm. uh and he's managing all of it himself Mm. and you just think you know what happens in that scenario if the piling contractor god forbid has some sort of accident in his back garden and like you say he's the he's the main he's the main client so i think people aren't really aware of uh what their responsibilities are in this area when they're managing a project themselves yeah um that is not to not to scare anybody but it's just going with your eyes wide open i guess yeah definitely and that's part of what you're paying for if you are able to subcontract it is that you are you're subcontracting some of that risk as yeah. well as as well as the the practical practical work yeah it's a very it's a common it's a really common situation like i say there are some derogations away from that for for a for a uh, for a domestic client but it's it, it's where you um 
it's it's where you step over that line and you really really you're running the site that 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 can get that can get tricky. Yeah. Um, and if people are wanting advice in that kind of area, how do they get in contact with you? Yeah, they can get in contact us via the website, which is cdmmuk.co.uk. Awesome. All the all the good all stuff the UKs. there. Oh yeah, it is. There's a contact form there, and we you can get in touch with us, and we can provide this uh, this service nationally. It's perfect, perfect. What I'll do is I will pop your details in the um, in the bottom of the podcast, so all the information will be in there. If anybody wants to reach out to Graham, uh, his details will be there. Thanks a lot for coming in today, Graham, and speaking to me. That's 45 minutes of your time. You're not going to get back. Thank you. I know. Sorry about that. Uh, So thanks a lot, folks. Uh, Thanks a lot, Graham. And I will speak to you soon. Cheers now. Bye. And that's it for today, folks. Thanks a lot for listening to the RCR microcast. Remember, if you've ever had any value whatsoever from this podcast, you could do me a massive favour by heading over to wherever you get your podcasts and leaving us a review. Thanks a lot for listening to the show, and I will speak to you on the next one. Cheers. Bye. planning back on track the next logical step is to go to www.go-roavr.co.uk right now and get your instant quote today